site uh, 100% dedicated to understanding news photographs and uh, visual news. Uh, we're completely unique uh, here uh, for our um, image-driven approach uh, uh, in analyzing visual news stories through discussion of the pictures themselves. This is uh, either our 22nd or our 23rd salon dating back to 2008. I want to um, thank you, uh, give some thank yous to our team, uh, Teresa Mahoney, Meg Handler, uh, Kara Finnegan. Uh, I'm Michael Shaw, the uh, publisher of Bag News. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background on the topic, say a word about the edit, uh, and then introduce Kara and get started. Uh, the purpose of this discussion is to better understand the edit uh, editorial framing of the events in Independence Square in Kiev. Um, specifically, we're focusing on the intense visual coverage of Euro Medan, um, or Independence Square, from January to late February, uh, leading up to the departure of President uh, Yanukovych. Uh, in terms of the edit, the photo coverage um, brings uh, many topics to mind, including um, sensationalism, uh, different symbols, and uh, visual stereotypes of war and history, the role of social media as a distribution channel, um, and civil war as um, increasingly a media event played out on a central stage. Uh, in terms of the, um, the edit, uh, we, the, this event uh, particularly was notable for a sense of drama and even theater. Uh, we tried to um, capture that, um, capture the more prevalent images and types of images uh, so we can try and understand them better. Uh, then um, we also tried to balance um, the edit with a um, uh, cross-section of themes including um, state power and popular uprising, uh, religion, gender, demographics, of course geopolitics. Uh, and then um, we were especially tuned to the role of portraiture in the, cover in the coverage uh, and, um, and we're also curious as to why that, that was true in, in, in this case as opposed to the coverage of Tahrir Square or um, uh, uh, events in, uh, in uh, Taksim Square in Turkey, etc. So uh, we have a fantastic panel today. I don't want to uh, steal any of Kara's thunder, but you know, David, Katya, um, uh, Patrick, uh, and then um, our two photographers, uh, uh, Donald Weber and Brendan Hoffman, were waiting for Donald to join us. And uh, Brendan um, was just called away on assignment. He's in Donetsk, and he said it's been completely quiet there for three days, and then two minutes ago he got a call. So uh, he's uh, investigating and uh, he may be uh, joining us um, uh, at some point uh, over the next uh, 120 minutes. We'll see. Uh, so um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, our moderator and uh, a, a great colleague and friend, um, Kara Finnegan. She's a professor of communications at the University of Illinois. She co-wrote uh, the book, I say, uh, call it the book, uh, on visual rhetoric. Um, and then uh, she's a leading scholar in visual research. She's known for um, her work on Lincoln, the Civil War, the visualization of poverty, and more recently, uh, somewhat in cahoots with myself, um, uh, White House Art and the Obama Flickr site. So I uh, turn you over to Kara, and um, I will also be doing some live tweeting, and if you're following uh, or participating on Twitter, uh, use um, hashtag bag salon, B-A-G-S-A-L-O-N, uh, and we'll also try and work in some of your questions and comments if we can. Um, thanks very much. Thanks, Michael, um, and thanks to everybody who's joining us live at the salon um, or who may be watching an archive version of it later. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today, uh, and uh, I'll begin um, on your visual left with David Campbell. Uh, David Campbell is an independent writer, researcher, lecturer, and producer who analyzes visual storytelling and creates new visual stories. Most recently, he was appointed secretary to the World Press Photo Contest Jury, and he directed the World Press Photo Multimedia Research Project. Katerina Haskins is associate professor of rhetorical studies in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Her research examines visual rhetorics of public memory and national identity. Patrick Whalen uh, is a former uh, international assignment editor at Getty, former national news photo editor at Wall Street Journal, and currently is world news photo editor at the Wall Street Journal. As Michael mentioned, we uh, also uh, 
have two photographers scheduled to join us today. Uh, Donald Weber, who is on assignment, but we hope will be appearing shortly. Um, he is a documentary photographer who's received the Guggenheim Fellowship and won two World Press Photo Awards. He has photographed extensively in Ukraine and Russia, publishing books on Chernobyl and post-Soviet authority. And we will be discussing a few of Donald Weber's photographs today. And then also, as Michael mentioned, Brendan Hoffman. Uh, uh, he is a news photographer and co-founder of the Prime Photography Collective. Brendan's work has been published in Time and in the New York Times, and he has received awards from Pictures of the Year International and the White House News Photographers Association. He's currently based in Moscow, and we'll be discussing one of his Ukraine photos today. And as Michael mentioned, um, Brendan was, until just a few minutes ago, joining us from an apartment in Donetsk, Ukraine, and he has had to go off and um, chase some news, so we may be hearing back from him. Uh, and we hope Donald will be here, but at minimum we will be discussing uh, the photographs of, of both of these great photographers. Um, I thought that we might begin, then, with, uh, with the edit, um, and let's look at the first image uh, in the slideshow, if we can. Um, David Campbell, uh, you and, and Michael, uh, I think, collaborated on the idea for this salon, and this photograph seems to be a good place to begin talking about the question of what is it that makes, uh, that made, and then certainly continues to make the Ukraine story um, so visually compelling. Well, I think it, it's it's the dramatic aesthetics, you know, that are evident in this in this slide. I think that was something that struck me through January and February watching it. Uh, the number of times that you saw references to apocalyptic uh, fire and ice appeared in the title, uh, because it was taking this these protests were taking place during winter as well, uh, and you just had these extraordinary contrasts of of color and form that made these, you know, very dramatic images and made them stand out in relationship to other protests, you know, that might have been taking place in Turkey and Venezuela at the same time. So they were a really good illustration to me of, of how the question of aesthetics is, you know, at the heart of news photography. Um, you know, the quality of the aesthetic plays a really significant role in getting certain things up the visual news agenda, and, and this is a good case, I think. Yeah, let's talk about some of the features of the image itself because one of the things that, that really strikes me is it's so um, it's so symbolically dense in a way that really for especially for uh, uh, somebody not immediately in that context requires some interpretation. And I wonder if we could maybe pull apart some of the elements of the just the visual density uh, in this image, which I think really illustrates nicely those sorts of principles that you were talking about. Well, I think there. I mean, I think there is obvious density in terms of kind of the panoramic nature of the people in the square, uh, the number of people you know framed within this shot, who kind of parallel in a way the number of people in the statue on the left, and it's as though the live people kind of echo the statue to that extent. Um, but at the same time, I do think that that one of the things with the news photographs was, and maybe it's an unavoidable characteristic of news photographs of protest in these circumstances, is you do get a kind of a, a, a binary sense of the situation. That is, you know, of protesters or rebels or however they're being framed. Uh, linguistically versus authorities and I think that you know in terms of understanding the complexity of the politics that were taking place in 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 Euromaidan and the square itself you know there is a slight risk that's perhaps inevitable to capturing an image that um, it becomes a more binary presentation uh, and it has a little bit more difficulty even when the image is dense like this it's still readable in terms of protesters versus authorities Yes, we certainly do not see any faces. The photograph is taken from behind uh, the group of protesters, and uh, the only thing that I think stands out is the, is the color of their headgear, um, in addition to the flags that adorn the sculptural um, composition, which is a very important landmark, actually, because it, it places the photograph, because at least in tourist guides, this is always highlighted as the statue that represents the legendary founders of Kiev. And so here it has been 
appropriated by protesters as a kind of uh, to augment the symbolism of their um, of their rebellion, right? So they're they're fighting for Ukraine. Um, you don't see uh, European Euro flags here. It's it's definitely Ukrainian uh, accented uh, protest. So the color versus the darkness, the the smoke. Um, also is a very big contrast and I think uh, it makes for a much more dramatic uh, portrait as opposed to, and we'll, we'll look at those later, I think the, the riot police uh, are pictured pretty much monochromatically, um, there's hardly any color. So the color, I think, highlights at least visual diversity of the protesters as opposed to the monochromatic uniformity of the riot police. So also, you don't. Lot of, yeah. I'm sorry, Patrick. I was going to say you don't see the government forces or the riot police in this photo at all, which is kind of interesting. You just see the darkness behind fighting this this force. It is very apocalyptic in that sense. And I think in general, at this stage of the coverage, photographically, there was far less focus on the riot police and government forces, they were always behind shields, behind riot masks and so forth, so you never really got a very good sense of the identity of these people. It was, um, as she just said, sort of this monochromatic, mm -hmm. faceless force that we were looking at every day as compared to the protesters who were wearing a variety of makeshift uniforms and civilian clothes and helmets and whatever whatever they could get. Yeah, it's an interesting point because uh, throughout the coverage it was hard to tell from the pictures uh, uh, to get a sense of like hierarchy of, of authority. It just seemed like, um, or even to tell like who is, uh, who is in charge or who is I guess winning and losing if you know we end up in that kind of paradigm with news photos. But this, in this, a lot of the photos you saw not just the statue, but somewhere you'd only see the female figure. And if I understand it, she also represented a um, Slavic goddess, um, and is seen um, to some extent as like a, protect, a protectress uh, of Kiev. And it, it's interesting that she, through like even more and more smoke and other images, continues to have that kind of. Um, well, maybe that protective sense, uh, the way her arms are outstretched like that. Yeah, it seems like one of the real themes that emerges, I think that probably will emerge in our discussion of a lot of the different images, is the, the theme of improvisation. In some way, there, there, that there's the sense that um, there's an organization, but it's a loose, improvised organization, and you see that um, uh, in a really compelling way here, again, the, the appropriation of, uh, of the statue in the square, uh, the, the diversity in terms of uh, the way people uh, are dressed, as, as Katya pointed out. Um, but also there's a real, there's a coordination. So I was really struck, David, by your comment that the, that the, the figures, um, we might kind of say at the front lines, in other words, in the background of the photo on the right, um, echo the statue in some way. And, and there is a kind of body placement that suggests a coordination and a, and a kind of skill even within the improvised, right? It doesn't, it feels, it, this image to me is surprisingly unchaotic, even though it is improvised. Um, there's kind of a plan being implemented here, I guess, might be the way to think about it. You might remember uh, during Tiananmen Square, the protesters there building the statue in the middle of the square, the big uh, freedom freedom uh, symbol person person there that they were all rallying around, just something some sort of central image to convey this um, their message. Um, can I can I ask Patrick a question? Actually, I mean, if this had come through your stream, it may well have come through your stream, Patrick. Would you have published this? either online or in print, and, and what would have been the major criteria for publishing this as, as something to reflect the, the situation? Well, this particular image might be difficult just because it, it, it would require, in print anyways, 
publishing it quite large to understand yeah. what was happening here. Um, online, we may have used this or something very similar. I don't, I don't recall, but um, I think you know it, it does give a good sense of what was happening overall at that moment, and you do get this good sense of the protesters and and kind of the the chaos that was happening on that day. Um, you know, for for me, I personally liked seeing the faces of the protesters quite often, and um, kind of juxtapositioning them with with the government forces, if possible. But um, I think this one particular image is uh, is is quite beautiful, and and the way it is framed with the statues, um, I, I would have considered it, but I don't think this is one of the ones that actually made it into print. I think um, we usually go for something that's. Um, maybe a bit easier read in terms of what's happening and where the people are in in juxtaposition to the other forces that that they were going up against so this would feel like more ambiguous to you or or more chaotic or maybe ambiguous i just think it's um it gives a good sense of mood and atmosphere but not necessarily information about the overall situation that day um, also, we had to try and show something to the readers every day to give them information about new developments. Um, so at, at certain stages throughout the protest, we chose to show wide views of the whole scene from Independence Square. Um, other times, we might focus in on individual protesters. Um, once certain aspects of the protest began to take shape, for instance, I, I remember when Molotov cocktails really uh, started being used maybe just um, a short time before this day and um, some of the other weapons that started coming out. Um, it, it was important to present fresh images every day. Um, so we had, to, we had to mix it up visually and so we might take something like this, maybe juxtaposition it with another detail or another protester or something else. But um, this is a great image that gives a gives a nice overall sense of the of the uh, Euro Maidan protesters' point of view. Sorry, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an interesting role. Um, I mean, I really appreciate you being here today because, you know, for us to really understand and appreciate the, you know, the editorial, you know, role and, and, and task and, and especially challenge with this event, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the balance, balancing information with beauty, uh, in looking at maybe thousands of pictures really from those uh, two months, uh, the challenge it seemed like qu quite a challenge in terms of really striking that balance and 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 being able to temper just this all this incredible symbolism and 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 powerful and sensational imagery with you know trying to get you know the real the the, the meat of the story from an informational standpoint yes that's correct and in order to keep our readers engaged and to invite them into the stories it was important to try and present a diversity of images every day um, at certain stages throughout the protest as dramatic as those images were it was hard to show something different every day um, you know the protests themselves can be difficult in the sense that it can it can look similar on some days there was actually very little happening um, in terms of clashes between the protesters and the government uh, riot police so we would then focus in on some things for instance um, the the life of the protesters behind the barricades um, what they were doing to stay organized they were setting up hospitals and first aid centers they were serving each other tea they were bringing out sandwiches they were playing guitars they were doing all sorts of things um, it was very tempting to go in on, on on certain images on those days, but again, it was also very important to 
show readers new developments every day. Um, you know what what was new today. Um, you know you might you might see Molotov cocktails being broken out. You might see um, guns. I remember starting to make their first appearance when you'd see some of the Maidan protesters with. Um, I, I believe they were just air rifles or BB guns, but they started showing them. I think right about at this time as well. Um, anything new we wanted to really show, and then um, once once uh, snipers and actual shooting started, of course that all that all shifted. But for a couple of weeks, we just had rock throwing and uh, you know sort of these these uh, clashes that were mostly just physical in terms of um, clubs and beatings and tear gas and things like that. But that can also be very similar to a lot of other protest events we've been seeing all along. So it's, what's interesting about that is it, it, it sounds like you're suggesting that there are um, almost kind of standard standard visual themes for, uh, for, for protest or for visual protest coverage. And you both um, have to work with what you have in terms of those standard themes, right? The ebb and flow of the interactions with the protesters and the government, um, the 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 way that the uh, folks are working behind the scenes. But then also, there's something that you have to do uh, to keep that lively and fresh um, for for your readers and for the viewers looking at uh, the images. Um, that might be a good uh, moment to switch to our second image. Um, which, you know, if this first image doesn't give us uh, uh, the state, this image certainly does, and, and it taps into some of that, uh, 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 some of the themes, I think, of the protest, and also um, some of the aesthetic elements that we talked about a little bit um, early on. Um, also, it looks like... Uh, Donald Weber is here with us. Welcome. We have introduced you already, and so your uh, your appearance is uh, is uh, heralded already. So welcome, and uh, feel free to dive on in into the conversation um, uh, as we talk about this image. Michael, um, I, I have to say, when when he was walking me through this edit, uh, was referring to this photo as the Middle Earth photo. Yes. Um, and that's so Robert here. I have to give credit Robert to Robert here. Okay, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, he did a piece <laughs> on the blog. And so, um, uh, you know, thinking not only, I guess, about themes, but almost really archetypes <laughs> uh, in, in terms of these photographs. So I wonder if anybody wants to maybe walk us through their interpretation uh, or an interpretation on this image. Well, I think that it's very uh, reminiscent of a lot of... Um, film imagery of mindless drones who are launched by a di dictator to suppress the people's rebellion. I'm thinking back to 1925, um, Sergei Eisenstein's classic, Bell um, Potemkin, where we have these uh, soldiers marching um, uniformly down the steps and slaughtering civilians, women and children. We never really see their faces. Uh, they're basically this robotic um, brigade <laughs> that is suppressed in the rebellion and uh, it, it brings up it, and it's a it's an archetype and I think it's repeated in some um, popular culture uh, versions of that so we see that in uh, George Lucas's trilogy um, the drones the drone army right uh, so so there's there's certainly a visual trope that is at work here About the Apple 1984 commercial. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. My, my favorite association. <laughs> <laughs> or World War II allied propaganda posters, um, those very graphic posters that we used to see where there would be um, just kind of, you know, these, as she said, sort of robotic stormtroopers with helmets and no faces and sticks, kind of just ready to come in and start start uh, beating civilians and so forth. Um, yeah, I'll say something here. 
Uh, hello, everybody. Sorry for being a little bit late, just uh, working. But um, one thing that I noticed straight away is that it's actually from the other side. It's from the other perspective. It's from the police perspective, which is something that you rarely uh, saw from uh, from Kiev uh, during all the uh, Euromaidan uh, events. So for me, that's actually kind of a stunning image because it is from that other side. And we were always led to believe that it was this, this massive army of protesters. Uh, but when you look here, I love just the little uh, specks, the little dots on the snow hill, but it's an army of police. So in a way, it's kind of the roles are reversed here. This is the perspective of the, of the protester with the police in the background. But here we've actually flipped it where it's the police in the foreground and the protesters in the back. And uh, it's quite an amazing uh, sight because, as I said, it was pretty difficult to get on that other side. So um, it's good to see a rare point of view. You know, thinking about what Patrick said earlier about news value, um, is that then the news value of this image? Uh, it, it is so uh, symbolically dense and, 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 and so elusive, and several of us have you know, come up with analogies of what this looks like. But, Dom, it sounds like what you're suggesting is uh, this did show us something we didn't see, and therefore it was visually fresh um, in the context of the other images that were circulating at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I see that it's, uh, you know, it's a local guy, Anatoly Boyko, who's Ukrainian and from there knows it and understands it. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with it. And I guess a criticism, or not necessarily a criticism, but uh, uh, an observation that I made is that, and this is not just to stick to Ukraine, but I think this is news coverage in general, even though we're supposedly objective observers, we always identify with one side or the other. And certainly in this case, we identified with the underdog, the little guy who's throwing his uh, little Molotov cocktails against this giant army of robotic uh, drones dressed in black and helmets and shields and such. So I do think that there was probably a weak imbalance between uh, both sides who are perpetrators in uh, what was happening over there in Ukraine. I'm, I'm fascinated again with um, the uh, how the photo editor is looking at this photo and seeing how much it's uh, I, I guess how much it represents informational content. I'm, I'm just curious Patrick if looking at something like this because this photo was really widely published, one of the ones that was most widely circulated, how much this feels like it's about uh, aesthetics and how much it is informational and and, and maybe it's a, it, maybe that's a win-win, I'm not sure, but I'm curious to uh, what, what you think. Yeah, well ideally as an editor you'd like to have both when you can, you like to have the beauty and well-composed photograph and something that's just very interesting to look at as well as something that's going to inform the viewer and give them a sense of what's happening today. Um, I think as we've been saying the the great the great thing about this is it sort of gives some perspective of what's happening. Um, I don't I don't say that this is necessarily representative of the police versus the protesters. I mean, there's certainly situations where there's quite a few more protesters out there than than we see here. But um, you do kind of get a sense of this sort of massive force um, against against uh, the civilians and a much less organized and armed and prepared group of people on the other side. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't see that this gives a whole lot of humanity to the to the government side of, of, of the equation um, but um, still it must be interesting just to put yourself in this place I mean these people they're 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 Ukrainians as well and they're going up against these people they probably don't know quite what their day is going to bring or what they're going to face um, and uh, you know most of them are most likely just going out and doing their job today. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I do like that it gives a little more proportionality in terms of what the size of the force the protesters were facing.
possibly in general. Maybe Donald or someone else who is on the ground can can speak to that. But um, you know, usually seeing the side from the protesters, y you just see this line of shields and and uh, riot helmets, and and you don't necessarily get get a sense of of quite how large the uh, the force was that they were up against and it makes it all amazing that they were able to do that or had the courage to do that and go up against these people with with their makeshift arms and and uh, weaponry actually one uh, sorry one one interesting thing uh, I would just pick up on what Patrick was saying was um, a lot of these guys and you can tell because they're all wearing black or uh, dark blue. These aren't actually regular uh, service police. These are young recruits into the military, so they're 18, 19, 20 uh, years old who are sort of the frontline fodder, the cannon fodder, so to speak. And the specialized cops, actually you can see on the lower left, he's kind of got like the gray or the uh, blue camouflage. Those are the barracoots or the, the actual uh, professional police. So this is actually right now an army of uh, unprofessionals forced to uh, do a job. Yeah, I think that uh, Harriman's blog uh, juxtaposes this photo with a picture of a, it's a sort of um, almost a close-up of a young recruit uh, in this riot gear who looks miserable. Um, and he, he looks very, very young. He looks like a teenager uh, who's been dragged into this whole thing. So, um, yeah, I think that just having this image certainly does not reveal anything about the identity of the people who are assembled there. Um, we don't have a personalized insight <laughs> into the identity of the riot police or, or the recruits. But... Yeah, I guess it's it's part of the juxtaposition, right? Because we read images in context of other images, and so um, I guess I would be wondering whether um, I don't know Wall Street Journal would publish these two images side by side to give us some sense of the humanity of the people who are concealed behind these uh, uniforms and this riot gear. Yeah, of course um, we we when possible and when space allows would try and run juxtaposing pictures showing both sides um, or pictures where you could see both sides in the same photo there was often these images of face-offs between the protesters and and the government forces um, you'd often see pictures for instance of um, uh, you know, young people just going up and um, walking right up to the to the line of of riot police, very reminiscent of 1960s Vietnam War protest images, where you have a young girl coming up and giving a National Guard soldier a flower or something like that. Um, I, we we like to see these kind of interactions. Um, in, in the photos when you can or to try and get a sense of what both sides are are doing um, generally to be to be fair to everyone but um, I, I think the protesters just had such a monopoly on on the types of images that they were they were putting out there for the press um, you know you'd have you'd have um, protesters sitting behind barricades playing guitars you know it looked like the the 60s behind there you know um, and and wearing sort of the the makeshift uniforms with all kinds of um, personal touches and helmets and um, you know just homemade homemade um, things of all sorts shields whatever they could get their hands on at the time but yeah we we would run both and um, you know, I think compared to where where things are going now in terms of the coverage, um, where you don't quite see so many of these face-offs, the um, the um, pro-Russian, I guess I'll call them supporters, um, don't have these. 
I don't know, I, I guess little villages in front of a lot of the, the barricades where they are, where there's hundreds of people camped out every night. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a different scene. Um, and we're still trying to show both sides, of course, all the time. Um, but generally, yeah, we do try and juxtaposition the, position, the, the opposing forces um, or show them interacting, I think, is ideal. Yeah, in, I had... In a violent or peaceful way. Yeah, I thought it would be helpful, because uh, this is a nice transition point, to look at some of the images um, of the protesters, as you were saying, and how they are, um, again, that more uh, improvised, right, personalized, um, and also useful <laughs> set of tools uh, that, that they are adopting um, for themselves. And um, can, can somebody talk to the significance of the Red Cross? There, the, the the shields with the red, what look like red crosses on them. Do we have a sense of what those are meant to indicate? Um, well, the, it's uh, I'm going to take a guess here, but definitely a symbol of Western Ukraine because it's just it's a Catholic cross, not an Orthodox cross. Okay, that's my sort of interpretation of it right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is sort of one of the battle lines, is that Western Ukraine is Catholic, you know, the rest of the country is Orthodox. And it was not really a potent part of the protest, but it definitely was a part, the religious aspect. I think we were all very intrigued by the images we'd see every day during the protest of, um, of uh, priests giving Mass and... Um, they were very present throughout these protests, um, walking out in front of the, the the protest lines and people coming through, um, carrying the the pictures of the religious icons, seemed to pervade a lot of the a lot of the images we were seeing every day. Um, I'm not sure. I, I I'm not sure if they were Catholic or or or. Um, Orthodox, exactly, probably both. I'm assuming Donald, um, but um, that was just a, a a big part of the the images and the photos that we were seeing every day. Um, you know, I think it was it was interesting at first, and then um, I think we had to move on to different types of images to show. But uh, it was pretty powerful to see this every day and to see the involvement of the church and um, what they were doing there. I don't know if there's um, more, you know, more Donald can explain about that, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's been a constant present in the presence in the photos every day. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the religious aspect is really interesting because on one hand you would have Orthodox priests who were sort of very much involved in the protests and certainly when the uh, funerals happening for the, uh, those who were killed by the snipers, uh, and also sort of like a moral voice that was continuing for months on there. But on the same hand, I remember covering the Orange Revolution, those who were sort of, and you'll see this now with the protests happening in uh, eastern Russia with the pro-Russian side, and you see the old babushkas with the, with the icons holding it up against the tank, which is sort of like a stop. So <laughs> it's really tough to say which role, what role does religion play. I think in this case it's sort of... Uh, using it to who's ever advantage at that point. So it's definitely not fair to say that the Orthodox Church was a pro-Euromaidan um, movement, but in the same sense, they were very much a part of it. And uh, But then they're also very much a part of the what's happening in the east of the country, too. So it's, it's these kind of polar sides within the same sides, so to speak, I guess. I guess it all comes down to individual choice of where do you see religion and how can it be a part of uh, this thing that you're, you're a part of. Actually, I would like to um, maybe introduce a little correction. Western Ukraine is not entirely Catholic. Uh, there, There's quite a bit of mix. Um, I actually go to to an Orthodox Ukrainian church in Troy. I'm actually missing the liturgy today. <laughs> and uh, most of the people there who are, you know, some of them are first generation immigrants, um, they are from Western Ukraine. So there's quite a bit of um, mix. And uh, some families would have 
members who are Orthodox and others would be Catholic in the same family, so there's quite a bit of uh, diversity in that way. So it's not one or the other. Yeah, and I mean, and that's one of the that's one of the 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 criticisms that really really bothers me when I'm reading coverage about Ukraine is that they split it left and right. The left side of the country is ca is Catholic and Ukrainian. The other side is Russian and Orthodox, which is not true at all. It's just a giant mix. And if you go to Kiev, which is the capital of the country, it's the biggest city. Uh, it's essentially a Russian-speaking sound. The lingua franca of daily life of business in Kiev is Russian. And mm -hmm. even when you go uh, into the West, there are pockets where Russian is still. It's it's the language of the bureaucracy is Ukrainian, but essentially, you know, Russian is still very much being spoken by Ukrainians. It's uh, all of my friends. Actually, I was just thinking of that the other day. Every single one of my friends in Kiev are all Russian speakers, but they're very much identify with being Ukrainian. Uh, and then same thing with the religious aspect. There are pockets in the in the East that are also Catholic. So it's it's very uh, easy to to take the river and say everything east of the Dnieper is Russian Orthodox. Everything west is Western Catholic. It's a very simple argument. It was actually incorrect. Yeah, I, I had Teresa uh, move us ahead to this image, uh, which was later in the edit, uh, because it seems to reflect the, the kinds of things we're talking about uh, right now. And, um, and, and in some ways, the, the religious aspect is the introduction of a, of a, a third interlocutor, different institution into, into the, the conversation uh, about class. <laughs> And as, as you're highlighting, it really complicates the story um, in a variety of ways. Um, and this image, to me, the, the juxtaposition between the foreground and the background is really interesting. Um, we've got the kind of almost personal moment uh, that's happening in the foreground with the priest. And then uh, in the background, uh, we have a woman who um, it, to my eyes, at least, appears to be in a kind of posture of scolding. I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure if that's how others read it. But I'm curious if anyone wants to uh, kind of read this image into this conversation we've been having about religion. Well, I think that we know from the coverage that priests of all denominations, um, and not just uh, Christian, but you know, there were Jewish uh, rabbis uh, participating in ministering to the protesters. Um, but, you know, we, we also have learned that priests were extremely brave in intervening between the parties and uh, that they ministered to both sides and they assisted in removing uh, or moving to safety the wounded um, on both sides. So I think that um, they, they were fulfilling their mission as peacemakers and trying to minimize bloodshed overall. But I guess from the images that we get, mostly they seem to have aligned themselves with the protesters side. Um, so we, we get this additional symbolic uh, layer um, that religion is giving some moral authority to the protesters and obviously this particular image is interesting in the way that this this man who appears to be a protester um, this is this is a confession right so it's performed in an unusual place uh, he's not in a church um, he's kind of an out in the open and uh, the image raises a question, at least for me, you know, what is he confessing off? Is it something that he has already done or um, his intentions? So, so there's, there's this very kind of um, poignant moment, I think, that signals to us the sort of the ethical, the moral dimension of this, of this confrontation, that it's not just about um, Against this army of drones, but it's 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 brother brother against brother in a way. So there's a, there's this I think that and the the old lady who appears to be chiding the soldiers or the police um, is probably appealing to them to to treat protesters as as people rather than outlaws 
um, so so th I think this this image is very ethically uh, poignant, um, and and I, I guess I would I would I would wonder whether this this complexity would be um, legible to readers in the West or in the United States. So uh, would um, would a mainstream publication feature this image uh, as representative of what's going on? Yeah, I think we, I mean, we, we did publish either this image or a very similar one, but I think what we started seeing was so many images like this that we felt like there was a certain degree of theater going on here. Um, you know, someone's receiving confession. It's not typically something one does in the middle of the street in front of a hundred photographers. Um, so you have to look at these a little bit skeptically at, at, at some point. Not that I doubt the sincerity of the person or the fact that the priest was there performing his mission, um, but so publicly, so frequently, we saw these types of images that after a while we just had to sort of question, you know, are we sort of playing into something here, showing showing one side with with religious um, leaders so often, so publicly. Yeah, actually, I'll just, like, again, a little context there. It's to get where this protester and this priest are takes a lot of work because this is <laughs> January 25th and the barricades have pretty much already been constructed and this is sort of a no man's land bef by the front line of the protesters and sort of the front line of the police slightly different and you really had to sort of snake your way in there so for these people to get in there this is absolutely what Patrick said it's a it's a, it's a, it's a performance a bit of theater uh. David, did you have a point about this image or one of the earlier images uh, of the protesters and the shield? I don't think we have your audio. Oh. That's why we haven't heard anything from David. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we're we've your audio's dropped out, David. But um, if you wanna, we have a text box. If you wanna type a comment or question, I could maybe um, direct it to the group as well. Yeah, David says he's gonna check on the audio. It was it was working fine uh, up until a bit ago. Um, so uh, why don't we go back to uh, the image of the shield, um, which I think is the third image in the edit, and there are a couple uh, of images um, that Michael included in the edit of the protesters uh, in this kind of improvised um, fashion. So we we uh, talked a little bit about um, the third image with the the uh, protesters and the green shields with the red cross on them. Uh, if we could move to that image. There we go. And um, uh, and maybe then move ahead to the fourth image and kind of treat these almost as a pair um, of pictures. Um, uh, these are, I, I guess, to me, kind of the encapsulation of this idea of improvisation. Um, and they're also really visually interesting uh, because they, again, are elusive. They invite us to, you know, I think about Monty Python uh, when, when <laughs> this image, you know, which is a kind of terrible, perhaps, but also funny way to, to read them. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what these kinds of images do. You know, in other words, what do we learn about the protesters from pictures like these, from the, the earlier one and then this image of this of this kind of these kind of improvised tools, which let's be clear are really designed for personal safety. These are not, you know, affectations for sure. A little bit of affectation. There's yeah, some yeah, strutting. Yeah, perhaps performance, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's I mean, you have, these guys, I've never seen anything like this before. 
not that I've been in a lot of protests and riots and such, but again, my my expectations were completely uh, smashed when I arrived to uh, Ukraine and see these kinds of uh, characters and such. I was absolutely astonished at the level of uh, do-it-yourselfness, and it is sort of a mix. It's like this strange, demented mix between. Uh, uh, self-defense and uh, performance again. But I also noticed as time wore on, as the uh, revolution got more and more bitter and angry and bloody, that uh, the sophistication of the armor and the technology that the protesters chose uh, to wear also became uh, more, I guess, um, uh, consistent, you know, the camouflage, uh, they, there were like shield production centers and weapon production centers. And so in, by the time I left uh, at the end of February, early March, it was sort of uh, an army uh, that had been assembled. As previous to this, it was just sort of a, a hodgepodge of those coming out to, uh, to see what's happening. Yeah, it was amazing to watch how quickly they were able to get standardized shields and helmets and uniforms and so forth in the matter of a, a couple of weeks they had full-scale production going on people putting these together and um, you know they 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 morphed into what they were fighting visually they started picking up the shields of the riot police and using those and with the standardized camouflage uniforms and patches and things it was really interesting to see everyone starting to, you know, go from this hodgepodge crusader look to sort of a regular army or, or militia almost. Um, there were certainly various groups within that, but, um, you know, over time it definitely became more and more standardized as they organized. Hmm. Well, this is this is an image taken uh, on January 20th. So this is before the major outbreaks um, of us. So yeah, there is definitely kind of a carnivalesque air to to the whole uh, scene. And uh, I don't know. For me, it kind of raised some question questions about these uh, these young people's motives. Uh, were they simply taking their recent obsession with playing knights uh, as kids into the real life. Um, uh, there's there's definitely not just performance and playfulness, but a kind of perhaps naive, um, naive boyish enthusiasm for things of that nature. <laughs> so, so you wonder to what extent these guys are serious, you know, what are they standing for necessarily? Um, are they there for the thrill of the, of the battle? Um, you certainly yeah, received I mean, I them. Yeah. Go ahead. You received them very differently from, say, uh, the guys who are military, clad in military uniforms and masked. Um, you know, you you see them sort of as kids, right? You you have a very different relationship to these uh, images. Um, I just, again, another thing that struck me was, as uh, Katya said, I remember. You know, they would put um, PVC piping on their uh, forearms and on their legs and these kinds of cheap motorcycle helmets and just plywood shields and such. And they were all raring, ready to go for battle, but it, their perception of battle was a filmic battle. It was a cinema battle. And when the battle actually came, they didn't turn and run away, but I think that it was a, definitely a shock that they were completely uh, blown away. By the technology of the uh, of the police and the government forces, absolutely annihilated. Yet they did manage to come back. So I think there was a heck of a lot of naivete there. Uh, the other thing that I found that going back to this idea of theater, I've never seen so many photographers in my entire life uh, in anything, let alone here. And uh, a lot of the guys would come up to us and say, "Take my picture, take my picture." This is again before the uh, 18th of February, but after the uh, smaller battles in uh, in January. So there was kind of this request, and there was a heck of a lot of uh, 
you know, Ukraine is very much a paternal society. I, I, it was always about macho and sort of uh, what kind of a man are you? And this was, for me, a, a place where boys could, be, could prove uh, their manhood. And especially a lot of the kids, you know, really were kids, late teens, early 20s. There was also a lot of middle-aged folks like myself, but I noticed there was a lot of young men. And a lot of the young men were actually from very small towns, villages. They came from farms. There was a heck of a lot of orphans. I've never met so many orphans in my life except in an orphanage. And to me, it felt like this is uh, a class of people who have been completely pushed aside, forgotten. The government has crushed them. They don't care about them. They don't give a shit about them. And that this was their way to sort of uh, take hold of their identity, take hold of their manhood, take hold of, uh, of something that was very personal to them, and then sort of be able to, to fight for it and to beat the police because effectively they did. And that to me was the, the, the transition, the engagements that I saw were these sort of smaller farm boys who over time actually realize through violence that this is the way we are going to uh, come forward and stand and be recognized as somebody, not as a forgotten uh, orphan. Yeah, um, can you hear my sound now? Yeah, you sound great, David. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I think what Donald's made a point there that goes back to something I wanted to make earlier too, which is that so many different things come together in these protests. There are so many motivations, so many dimensions of identity. So, m so much of politics and culture ebbs and flows around these protests. It's hard to identify single reasons. And we were talking a little bit earlier about you know, the division of the country into East and West and so on. And that's a classic narrative in all situations where we don't understand what's going on. We try and align identity and religion and territory so these things literally map nicely so that you can have a nice cartography of a country and, and its protest. And I think even the best maps of Ukraine and the best understanding of Ukraine has separated out religion and identity to too great an extent, linked it to territory in a way that you can imagine a partition of the country taking place. And you can imagine someone coming up with a peace proposal. And in many respects, this is Bosnia all over again. This is the logic of what I call apartheid cartography that you have this alignment of identity and religion and territory, or this claimed alignment of identity, religion, and, and territory. Um, the thing, one of the things I'm interested in is kind of what work do these visuals do in either fitting into that narrative that lets us falsely line up identity, religion, and territory in a simplistic way, and what work can they do in making, making that more complex? Um, I think that image we saw earlier of, of the protester, you know, potentially receiving confession in front of the line, you know, tends to give us the potential to read that quite simplistically as, as religion versus the state and these particular protesters having a particular religion and so on. So when we hear the story about this image, you know, and I think Donald's really good points about um, how people are using these protests in terms of kind of forms of self-affirmation and, and so on. You know, how can we get that more complex story visually? I think that's, and, and, and maybe that's asking too much of the visuals to do that by themselves. They have to do it in relationship to other things. But to me, that's one of the fundamental challenges here is, is how to get these things working together to end up with the more complex story. And that's such a key point, and it, it would seem too that a lot of that depends upon having a sense of who the audience for the visuals might be. So when these images are being published for, let's say, uh, a U.S. audience, right? You know, uh, what what can Patrick, as an editor, be expected to do uh, to to convey or to to work with those images to convey that complexity? Um, uh, and you know, then there's the variety of ways that they're circulated around the world, and then within the space. Um, you know, the geography of that conflict as well. But it, 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 is, a, it is a large demand. Um, but it would seem that we wouldn't all be here doing the variety of things that, that we do if we didn't believe that there was some heart of a visual story that was, you know, that it was worth the attempt, I guess uh, we might say. I'm curious about how much of the presentation of the visuals by the protesters was carefully 
planned or orchestrated and how much of it was organic and spontaneous. Um, I imagine a lot of these people, you know, have have grown up as we all have with seeing various protest movements, civil the civil rights movement, for instance, or um, Northern Ireland, or various various places where you have civilians taking up arms against a government, and they're always trying to present themselves in this, you know. I would say quasi-religious sort of sort of way, and um, this um, you know trying to this this almost David versus Goliath type type framework. But um, I, I'm just wondering how much the the protesters and and the organization of those protesters was was organized, and how much of it was spontaneous. I don't know if Donald would would know more about that, but I imagine that through um, you know the, the the organizers of the protest um, through Twitter and Facebook feeds and so forth might um, present certain ideas that the protesters would would um, would uh, would do or 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 what exactly was happening. But it was just uh, very interesting to see a lot of these sorts of very organized images of of these things happening behind the behind the barricades and what they were doing in terms of presenting themselves with their uniforms and things um, and interesting now that I see less of that happening even though the roles are reversed with the pro-Russian demonstrators um, I just see uh, less of them trying to present these traditional revolution or liberation images um, not so much as a civil rights movement but more of a visually it looks much more military I don't know if anyone can knows any more about that Donald or someone yeah well first thing that came to mind when you were talking about these sort of cultural references from a Ukrainian perspective you know as kids growing up the, through the media culture the, 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 the most prevalent thing that was coming up wasn't necessarily Martin Luther King or Northern Ireland, but Mad Max. And uh, <laughs> they look like Mad Max. Look at that guy right there. Mad Max sure. right there. And, and that's kind of, that to me was, uh, it was really about movies and pop culture and uh, uh, and the designs on their, some of the shields and stuff that's referenced uh, pop culture. But the thing that I find fascinating about Euromaidan, the Euromaidan movement, was that it didn't intend to be this. It didn't intend to be a guy with a metal bucket and a helmet on his head and bullets through the throat and batons cracked against heads. It was, uh, it was. We're tired of the corruption and we're tired of your lies and we're tired of you stealing and uh, let's just go out. I mean, Ukrainians, I got to give them uh, credit. They've been consistently and persistently protesting anything and everything on Maidan and elsewhere uh, through the country for the decade that I've been traveling there, I'm sure further. Um, and then as, you know, the unexpected brutality of the police back in, uh, I guess it was late November, I forget, the, the 22nd of November, the 28th of November, which was mm -hmm. when they tried to clear out Maidan. And so these violent movements escalated through. And so in order to um, uh, quash violence, you have to become violent too to almost cancel it out. So in, in it kind of became a, a haphazard army. And then in the end when the snipers came and shot everybody through the face, uh, they really had to militarize themselves and now it's essentially a paramilitary it seems, as opposed to what's happening in the East which began as a violent uh, uh, process, which you know they're saying, well we're doing exactly the same thing that's been happening in Kiev there's no difference, so why is suddenly America and Europe against us and you were for uh, the Euromaidan movement, but I think the big difference there is that what's happening in the East, that it's it started as a, a paramilitary operation rather than uh, uh, an organic protest. And it's interesting, I think, you know, what we saw in Independence Square and this whole group of protesters camped out there and, and so forth. I haven't seen it an exactly similar situation in some of the other places, um, Donetsk or Slavyansk, where they might have seized government buildings or set up checkpoints. The, the mass civilian presence and almost this protest city doesn't 
doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, it seems like there's a few, always a few people around, but you don't have hundreds of people setting up, living in tents behind, in, in front of these barricades. So the images that we were getting from, from Kiev and Independence Square were, were much more sympathetic, I think, because you just saw civilians out protesting the government and in these other places, the photos we're seeing now, it's just heavily militarized people, militias, um, heavily armed groups with masks. So visually, it's really hard to identify with masked men, really, um, and and people just standing guard and carrying automatic weapons and and all sorts of things, as opposed to these these makeshift militias and and protesters that we were seeing in Independence Square for for several weeks or months. But don't exactly. forget, up until February 18th, sorry, up until February 18th, the majority of these guys were also masked, which I find really interesting. Suddenly everything's gotten reversed. But I think <laughs> we're all smart enough media consumers to understand that what's happening in the East is an orchestrated movement as opposed to what was happening in Kiev was organic. I know half the population out there will probably call me a fascist sympathizer for saying that, but I think it's, uh, I think it's the truth. But I also find it interesting that suddenly the Barracoot, who were the guys that were shooting and these guys here in the, in the picture now, and then they get disbanded after the 20th, and now they've been brought back to sort of uh, rescue Ukraine from the abyss of Russian domination. I think and also those photos, those photos from from Maidan Square, reference other photos from other similar locations. So you you get the connection to Taksim, you get the connection to Tahrir Square, uh, and so on, and you and and that gives you that helps gives you, uh, you know. A particular way of reading, you know, what you're seeing. So, so you're not only reading that particular circumstance; you're reading that in terms of other circumstances that you've seen visually, where it's the, you know, the David and Goliath type struggle, the much more organic struggle. I think Tahrir Square in particular. Mm -hmm. How does this image read against that narrative, though? Because it would, um, I don't. We don't have a date on this, but my assumption is that this is somewhere between November and mid January. Uh, and but this image would seem to, uh, it would seem to engage Donald's point about this is a group of people that just got tired <laughs> of having to deal and and you know took things into their own hands, and um, at least at this point in the visual narrative, um, who is David and who is Goliath in the image is an interesting question, particularly in the context of where things now are, as Patrick was pointing out, looking quite different. So is this an empowering of, image? Does this image empower the protesters? Is this just a moment in time that we now see mischaracterizes what the bigger picture was in the square or in the country overall? Well, it's a, uh, sorry, go ahead, David. I was going to say I think it's potentially an empowering image because you know the two the two police stroke riot police are in full uniform, specific helmets, Kevlar jackets, no doubt well armed in some capacity and they're up against these guys still in their variety of of you know makeshift helmets flimsy plywood shields sticks and so on that look a little bit like reenactors doing something somewhere um, you know that it, it doesn't look like a massive military force against a weak state I mean it just it's a moment of vulnerability in the state through these two two police but uh, uh, I, as a result, I would see that actually in terms of the protest movement as quite an empowering image. I think it shows the raw physical power of and, and strength in numbers. I think that's one of the connotations of this image that these guys, these young guys may not be well armed, but they're they're acting together um, proves to be more powerful at least at this moment and within this particular um, shot than we could imagine. Yeah, I'd say this is one of the few few images that I've seen that actually show sort of the the riot police, the Berkut, 
really under siege and retreating and the, the protesters surging forward and of course you know you, you have a great perspective or the photographer does um, from the side of the Berkut um, with the protesters rushing forward usually you'd, you'd be seeing this maybe from the opposite side or the situation is so chaotic that the, the, the lines aren't as clear and, and a lot of these kind of photos it was it was difficult to even tell who was who or what was happening there was so much chaos and so many people involved but here it's 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 clear these guys are retreating and um, the protesters are surging forward in a very you know un, unorganized way with clubs and their makeshift shields and so forth it's um, it's you know it is empowering to see the the protesters doing this and um, but I think at this point you know you also have to start having some some sympathy if you can for the for the riot police as well again these are I don't know if they're well these I guess would be the more seasoned ones but you know they're they're professional police and they're out doing their job and you know here their their lives are clearly in danger and the one soldier is trying to help his comrade here so y you do have a little bit of sympathy for these guys and realize what what they're up against I got no sympathy for them <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I understand what you're saying in a larger sense. I guess just on a on a very small no. sense, I see I see one one guy trying to get his buddy out of danger. Yeah, you know, one thing that's I don't know if I'm slightly changing the topic here, but we've we've all been saying it, and I've been saying it, and I, I tried to articulate it in my own head, and I still haven't come to it yet. But I was really by the time my the the, the latter half of my time there during the you know, my Don was using the word protester because at some point they've they uh, progressed or they transformed or they evolved from protester. But to what? I can't necessarily call them an army. I, I mean, I, it was really tough to say, and I, I I'm reluctant to sort of use the the idea of protester because a protester to me is somebody who's and not to say that they don't have a cause because they do, but somebody who's got a cause, it's sort of, uh, I've got a few pickets. It might get violent, but it will only get violent very quickly and uh, tear gas that under no circumstances would I assume that uh, violence, extreme violence, death would occur. Uh, and walking around the central area of Kiev, which is where uh, all the barricades were, it really to me felt like that Kiev was under siege and that they were becoming a, a, a rebel force that had seized, seized the city, so to speak, but that also kind of uh, connotates a, uh, an extreme level of violence on their side as well, which I think in most cases they were just trying to defend and to secure their, their line. So I don't know if anybody else has a better word to use than protesters, but uh, these aren't the protesters of my father's generation, I guess I can say. <laughs> yeah, that question of definition and labeling is, is really interesting and uh, again we're dealing with a situation that's changing moment by moment as well and, and, and that question of identity that came up a little bit earlier I think folds in here to the extent that um, the, you know, if we call them protesters or not they are finding their own identity, but then that's also their representations of identity being thrust upon them in media, and that's also all changing um, as we roll. I just found um, it interesting how we just continue to have that tension, though, between the theater and then, you know, looking at this from a more, in, you know, informational um, point of view, that, and that the color pink. Uh, is plays such a, a role in the way it kind of also has a dialogue with the orange of the helmet and the way that some of the helmets and that color, the colors are really, the processing brings out those strong colors. I was trying to find an image uh, for uh, the salon that um, really captured the clash, the actual confrontation between the two sides and it was hard to find something that what an image that didn't have a kind of a more dramatic, hyper dramatic, or real theatrical quality to it. Um, and this was one of the ones that was, I think, less so. I, 
I thought it might be helpful um, if we, uh, Donald, I want to make sure we spend some time talking about uh, the images of yours that we've included here. And um, they're very different images than the other images we've been looking at. Uh, and so Teresa's going to move us forward um, to those. And what we've done is we've uh, put a group of images as a triptych, and then we've got shots of them individually. But I would like to hear you talk about um, why the Molotov cocktails and why the Molotov cocktails in this way. Um, mm -hmm. This is a really compelling group of images for me. Um, yeah, well, the reason I went to Kiev was not to be a photographer, but was just to be a citizen, I guess. I, I lived there, for people who don't know, I lived there for quite a few years. I have uh, quite a few friends there. To me, it's sort of my uh, second home. It's I feel it's the place that I came of age. I matured as a photographer. I kind of figured out my my voice and such. So Ukraine to me is very important. It's very personal and it's very close to me. And seeing what was happening was really just enraging me being at home. I, I had a desire as a young man to be a war photographer, but as I aged, I realized that that's somebody else's. Um, but seeing what was happening was really bothering me, not from a photographic perspective, but from a, a, a citizen perspective. So I just went to kind of throw rocks at the police with alongside my friends, to metaphorically. But well, I also wouldn't have minded lobbing a rock or two myself. But um, which actually then also goes to then my my expectations of, of what I was going to see when I got there because I was feverishly on Twitter and Facebook and the news and uh, websites and watching the live feeds uh, that they had set up and getting there and becoming incredibly not disappointed but realizing that the visuals that were coming out was not matching necessarily what was on the street. Uh, the problem that I have with photography is that you're always sort of confined to a very personal space. It's in front of you, it's immediate, and there are no, nothing happens beyond that frame. So I was expecting the whole city and flames and everybody whacking each other with uh, batons and such, and getting there, it's, it's kind of like a war zone. There was a front line, it was very small, maybe, uh, geez, I'm just looking around, I don't know, like a couple of big houses, really. Uh, and that was it. That was the front line. And then, of course, there were the real li the rear lines. There were the where the tents were set up, where all the barricades were set up along the uh, Krushatik and such. But um, so visually, I think subconsciously, I wanted to not necessarily subvert, but to find uh, um, find my own voice through all this visual clutter that was happening. The other amazing thing that I was uh, astounded by is every morning you'd have to check in to get like a little press pass to go to the front line, to go right up to the very front, uh, like a little piece of paper that then they would let you through. And you, you'd be there at 7.30 in the morning and there'd already be 75, 100 names. And you'd go back at the end of the day, there'd be 300 names. And this is just for photographers and videographers. Um, so that was something that was quite astonishing as well. And it's trying to think, well, how am I going to sift myself through this visual uh, clutter? I mean, there's some great photography that was being made there, but there's a heck of a lot of crappy photography that's also being made. So th those were all sort of the, the, the little things that percolated in my brain when I was thinking of it. But the other thing is I went there without an assignment. I didn't want an assignment. I didn't want, sorry, Patrick for you to call me and say, can you go do this? Because I felt then I would be obliged to do something for somebody else. And I just needed to go be there. Even if I didn't take a photograph, I wouldn't really care. But I know that's not my nature and that eventually I would figure it out. So that's kind of the long uh, breadth of how I got there. As for the Molotov cocktails, I just found them, again, the whole thing was an incredibly primitive um, existence from the protesters and even from the, uh, I mean, Ukraine in general is a pretty primitive place, I find it. Everything is sorry, jury-rigged together, and uh, I was always amazed that essentially it came down to these little glass bottles, which are a bunch of styrene and gasoline shoved inside of there that beat back this giant force of highly trained uh, uh, police officers and barracudes. So 
I guess it's kind of going into that narrative of the David versus Goliath. I didn't necessarily want it to say that, but and that's kind of where the 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 portrait or the still life of the bottle came from. So, in a way, if we remove the context of the people, we have sort of the object that's left to uh, to fight with. Did you see them as anthropomorphic? I mean, I sure do. Well, that's what. Yeah, it was stunning. Like actually, when I started collecting them, you know, that one there with the, it looks like a, a little wig with a person, and all of them were, uh, uh, had their own identity, and in a way I was kind of metaphorically seeing it as my, you know, I was talking about the orphans and these young kids that come from, come from little tiny poor villages, but who become these bottles and launch themselves at the police, you know, you, you take this utter worthless existence that they perceive they have, and suddenly you can fight back against this this uh, giant force with just this this thing. So in a way, I saw all these little bottles as uh, as uh, mimicry, I guess, of the of the uh, larger protesters at, at at large. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, we ran a photo in the journal right at the outset when Molotov cocktails started heavily being used and you saw the the protesters or activists or however you want to refer to them as becoming very organized in terms of collecting these bottles and filling them and passing them up to the front lines and it was just the the resistance shifted it was like another escalation from being passive with you know shields or sort of gas mask and defensive gear to breaking up cobblestones and bricks and rocks and things and then the next step was the Molotov cocktails which was you know shifting from defensive to almost almost a, an offensive weapon even though you know a relatively um, weak one for it worked for them but um, it did represent a shift in tactics by the protesters and an escalation of of the protests in general when they started using these from from a coverage point of view and we were kind of trying to show that I think the actual image we showed was was a uh, a group of Molotov cocktails on the ground where they'd all been collected to pass up to the front lines or possibly sitting somewhere near the front lines but um, you know it definitely did represent a, a shift in tactics among the protesters and you know it's also interesting it, it invokes revolutions and resistance movements you know that that we've all seen throughout history. I mean, I, you know, mentioned Northern Ireland comes to mind, but there's there's plenty more where these disorganized protesters or, or forces. This is usually the first thing that comes out because the materials are so uh, widely available. So it's just it's a it's a resistance image and a protest image, and it does kind of play the whole David versus Goliath type type situation. I did have one question for you, Don. Um, it, w one thing that uh, kind of after, well, during but more after the fact, you know, the, people have been talking about how much, you know, you were talking about Mad Max, how like the there's some the symbolism in a way like kind of distracted people who don't, you know, particularly people who don't understand the politics of the situation, that that there, that this was so so like filmic, and another word you used, and I'm wondering. Thinking about these portraits and showing them uh, the Molotov cocktails outside of the context in which they were used, I'm wondering what you think now, like kind of, you know, like just looking in the rearview mirror um, about taking this approach and this kind of presentation, given the fact that the event itself was so, you know, kind of fantastical in people's minds and, and so you know, more symbolic than po almost political. Yeah, I think somebody said to me the other day, aren't you worried about not discussing politics? And I think, well, I'll leave that to to, to, to other photographers and to other journalists and to other artists to, uh, to respond to that. I think uh, 
every work that we do that is based on some kind of reality is inherently political. Um, but yeah, looking back, like just looking now, I haven't looked at this work in a little bit. I, I, I like it, and I think what I like about it is more, again, as I, as I mature as a photographer, I start thinking about the idea of story and narrative and what it means, and I think a successful story allows the audience to bring their own um, perceptions and uh, misconceptions into a narrative, and that to me is kind of exciting. So, again, there are more than 300 photographers there, but uh, who are doing just a, a, a good job of reporting of what's happening, but there are times when we can just, uh, I guess, be a party to to some of the other little things that will get fallen by the wayside, I guess. And also, I should point out, like, this is very, this is only one small thread of a larger project I was working on. It's all very um, scientific, I guess, in nature, in terms of that it's, it's a lot of objects and such, but I was sort of trying, I originally oh, yeah. started uh, photographing, uh, did you lose me? No, no, no. Okay. Um, yeah, so I originally started f photographing like large scale architectural portraits of all the barricades and all the uh, the walls and the front lines and the, the things that went into creating the edges of this space and that it wasn't the people necessarily weren't my first focus, but in doing that then I said, well we need to now go, let's go down a level. So I, I, I made these large, maybe some people have seen them, these sort of large and I stitched them all together of all the characters that I had seen that inhabit this barricadal space, I guess. I don't know if barricadal is a word, but I guess it works for this. And then, well, okay, there's people within this barricadal space, but what do they have? In this case, they've got um, the Molotovs, and then I, I found little objects that the police had used, like special little um, these weird welded nail things and ball bearings and sort of Ill, other illicit types of weapons. And then lastly, I went to Mezhigiri, uh, Yanukovych's uh, crazy billion dollar estate and then photographed all the, uh, some of the objects that he had left behind. So together I kind of saw it as a, uh, as a table of elements of, of uh, Euromaidan. Huh. Table of elements, that's great. Uh, which will be a book, <laughs> sorry to plug myself here, but it is a, a, a small little book that I'm doing with Shilp Publishing again uh, in conjunction with uh, Ukrainian photographer Arthur Bondar. So, and he's been taking the codex, the, uh, the civil code of Ukraine, and then making collages with some of his photos and the codex together. So I figure between his work and my work, it's sort of uh, an interesting observation of what happens uh, in this kind of, uh, what, forgotten zone of law. I was reminded, actually, um, of something I read recently in the Wall Street Journal. There was a review of the art exhibit in uh, Vienna that was composed of artwork that was done by photographers and artists in, in Kiev. Um, but also there were some objects that were brought to the museum from from the Maidan, including the catapult that was throwing the Molotov cocktails at the police. Um, I thought this was very interesting because your your images of the different bottles, they're very artistic, so they're, of course, documenting the weapons, the improvised weapons of war, uh, but they're also very kind of whimsical in themselves, and I think, yeah, you can you can go anthropomorphic there as well. <laughs> but also the, the they are different. They're different bottles. They're, you know, many of them are beer bottles, and you can kind of have this idea of the civilian life that has been disrupted um, by this regime, and um, where people went from drinking beer and tossing their bottles aside to saving them and making weapons out of them. So, so they have the invite a story. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the less context you have for, for such an image, the more a viewer can bring to that. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, you know, the, the, the great sort of myth, but it's not such a myth because there's, there's a huge alcohol problem in Ukraine and Russia. And I was astounded at, um, I've never seen 
I've been around a lot of alcohol in my life in that country, and uh, suddenly all these uh, alcoholic bottles were just everywhere. So to me, it's sort of it's. I think when you when you do a good project and it's smart and you've kind of considered all the options, you get these little gifts. So for me, this sort of this talk of prevalent alcoholism. Um, uh, was kind of nice, but it, it's it's not what I was thinking. It was something that came back after. Uh, but secondly, I was really amazed on my don that there was no drinking allowed, and they were very strict in enforcing that. Uh, and again, my don pre all this stuff was a great place to go and jump in the fountains and get drunk. Um, it's a lovely public square to 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 hang out, and then suddenly to have this uh, dry space was was really uh, astonishing as well. You know what's funny was that uh, there was a comment on uh, the bag news post where we wrote about your these portraits, and the uh, the commenter wrote, "If you read the EULA, I guess that's the little term of service thing on the on the you know product." It says, if you read the U U L A U E U L A for Coke, you'll discover their bottles cannot be used for Molotov cocktails or any other revolutionary purpose. <laughs> They'll sue you. For real? Or was that a joke? I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's true. <laughs> like, oh, better Someone put that Someone out there down. needs to Google this right now. <laughs> Actually... Beer is not considered alcohol in Ukraine and Russia. People drink it as if it were lemonade or something. It's you know, and people carry bottles of beer around. You know, it's it's very. <laughs> it's something it's like you switch to. It's it's something you switch to after you're done drinking vodka or something like that. <laughs> a palate cleanser. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. It's. Uh, I remember my first time there. Uh, in the morning, and you know, seeing 16-year-old kids walking to school with a bottle of beer, I was sort of astonished, but quickly woke from that. I think, in keeping it away, I think Michael really conceived uh, of, of your Molotov cocktails as kinds of portraits, and so we thought we might uh, extend that to uh, other portraits. Um, Anastasia Taylor Lind uh, has made several uh, images. Uh, Again, of protesters. Although now I'm, you know, I feel like I should make brackets or have some kind of a uh, frame around that word, given that we've been questioning uh, the label itself. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about this image um, as a portrait. You know, one of the things, the images we've seen of protesters up until now in the slideshow have been not entirely, but largely behind masks, behind the, you know, the performative, protective armor, improvised, uh, and this is, a, I think, a portrait of a different order, and in a way, a kind of parallel, almost, uh, to, the, to the frontality of the Molotov cocktails. Um, so what do, we, what, do we, what do we think about this image of a protester? Does this, um, does this reflect who we think these folks are, uh, or does it tell us something that maybe we didn't know? I'll just add one one really quick thing here that and I'm glad you brought this showed this photo because Anastasia and I wanted to talk about Anastasia and, and where my work came from because Anastasia and I worked very closely together. We're also really good friends, but when we were in Kiev we stayed in the same apartment together. Larry Tal was also with us. So when you're within this group and seeing what she's doing, it's really tough. Like you in a way I needed to distance myself from from what she was doing and Frankly, I saw what she was doing. I said, "Well, that's pretty much uh, perfect um, to me." And also, another interesting thing: you talk about the mask. February eighteenth, twentieth, really was a real transformative uh, moment. Where, and I found Anastasia's work was really nice up to the eighteenth, but as after the eighteenth, after the twentieth, it, it absolutely changed because now this is the majority of her photos are from the twentieth onwards. So there's a transition that's happened is that the, they've, they finally have ripped their faces off and are proud of, their, uh, of who they are, that they stood there, that they fought there. As opposed to before, there was always a little bit of a reticence. That's why they were, you know, obviously worried with the government forces to me, but I really saw it as a symbolic movement to finally say, I'm not scared of you anymore. I'm taking my mask off. You shoot my friend in the head, I'm going to stand uh, beside him and show you who I am. So that, to me, that's what I love about her project is that it, it, it sort of had that level of, of uh, mournfulness, 
uh, and pride and uh, strength. And that's interesting too, given that the caption says that, that this guy was in Medan for 60 days. So then we, we assume that that, as you say, was 60 days of um, being more anonymous and needing uh, to be more anonymous. And so that does make this a really kind of profound uh, emergence for this, for this individual uh, kid, right? Yeah. Other thoughts on this portrait? I found this to be the most haunting uh, photograph of all of the ones selected for today because it's a portrait that, yes, gives us a very individual, individualized uh, insight into uh, the identity of a protester. And, and we do have this sort of stereotype of protesters as, as very young, um, young men. Uh, however, aside from the helmet, on his head that signifies his status as a protester um, that's actually been kind of loosened up, right? He, he's not strapped into it. Um, he is a young man who is just like any of our college freshmen. Um, he's listening to music, obviously, in his time off. He's, he's smoking a cigarette, so there's, there's a kind of tranquility about this image, but also um, I don't know, soulfulness. Um, he is looking straight at the camera. Uh, he's not cocky. Um, I didn't read this as being sort of in your face. He's, he's relaxed. Uh, his posture is relaxed. He's, um, he's confronting the camera um, with his gaze. He's looking back at us. And um, I kept thinking about this, this image, um, not just as an image, but ab about this guy, Ilya. Um, you know, what happened to him? Um, what's his story? Is he okay? So I think that this, this image, I think, invites the audience identification more than any other uh, image in this selection. And of course, there's a certain kind of uh, uh, bad boy eroticism about it, I should add. Uh, and perhaps he was uh, looking back at a female photographer um, and reminded me of, you know, uh, male movie stars, the bad boys, like Clint Eastwood in the Spaghetti Westerns with his cigarette, uh, um, Jimmy Dean, Alain Delon. <laughs> so so there's, there's that dimension. I mean, there's definitely kind of an eroticism and aestheticism about this, this picture. But I think that what confronts us is his sort of irreducible humanity. Um, It's funny you mentioned the eroticism because, uh, and it's too bad Anastasia can't make this call because that is something her uh, assistant, Emine, is also a woman. And so, you know, there's two pretty girls walking up to these guys who have been stuck on the barricades for 60 days. Oh, can I take your picture? They loved it. They felt like kings, <laughs> that they were sort of finally uh, being rewarded. And again, it goes back to that, that performance issue between photographer and uh, subject and that to me is the most interesting thing in documentary and photojournalism photography in general is that dance that you have between uh, yourself and your subject and the subject matter um, at hand and that's you know being there with Anastasia and walking her watching her work watching the way she she handles it and such to me is really uh, I wish I was a woman at times um, because there's certainly in a place like Ukraine which is a um, uh, very much paternal and macho, and it's about you know they would help her with the equipment. They she she would always be getting uh, kisses on the cheek and on the hand and such. So there was this strange little uh, uh, world happening there. So I love the fact that you picked up. I'm sure he's flirting. He thinks he's flirting with her, and Anastasia is probably slightly oblivious to the thing. But I love that dynamic, especially with portrait photography. I think it's it's great. Well, it, uh, it, I think what I want to do now is move on to discuss in absentia uh, Brendan's photo in our edit. Um, for those of you who weren't here at the, uh, with us at the beginning, Brendan Hoffman was with us and uh, from Donetsk, Ukraine, and then had to leave uh, in order to uh, call news. So uh, it, it's looking like he may not get back uh, during our time here, but I did want to make sure that we spent some time talking about uh, this image, uh, and I think several of us probably had questions for him about the nature of this image, and so in the absence of those, 
or uh, in the absence of Brendan's ability to answer them for us here, um, uh, we might kind of take this image on its on its own terms and 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 see what it offers us uh, to the the picture of the conflict as it's been laid out uh, in in our conversation and over the last hour and a half or so. Um, I'll say that to me, one of the really I just find this photograph incredibly compelling, and it's um, uh, part of me wants to caption it old media. Uh, it, it, it's such a kind of documentary. Uh, the photograph is documenting a documentary moment uh, that uh, is extremely unusual in general and particularly in this situation. So I'm really curious to hear what folks have to say uh, about this photograph from, uh, from Brendan. Well, you used to Sorry, go ahead, David. No, 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 after you, Patrick. Sure. I was just going to say that we, we saw quite a few of these types of images coming through where there'd be people painting around the square and so forth. And, um, you know, it's just interesting. Obviously, they're aware that this is a historical moment that they want to capture as an artist. And I, I love this and that you can just see his interpretation of the smoky scene in destruction going on behind him, it's it's really beautiful, um, and and you can go back and look at the coverage and and you can see various people's interpretations through paintings in the square, and some of them, you know, it looked more like a Paris street scene, very festive, and some of them were very dark and apocalyptic, like this one. Um, but um, it's it's really great and it's refreshing from a reader's point of view to just get these various levels of um, perception that the people there are also seeing. It's like you, the reader has this has has one level of perception here, and then you know you also get to see the artist uh, the artist uh, perception of it as well. It's it's uh, really great. Yeah, it's I was going to say. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, I was going to say that I would entitle this photo criticism because I like <laughs> the, the way how it gets to the one of the most common descriptions of uh, dramatic photos. That is that they're quote painterly, and the number of times that from Ukraine people talked about this photograph looks like Hieronymus Bosch or it looks like a Bruegel or something like this. And here we have, you know, photographer taking image of painter, taking image of scene and, and so on. I mean, I find the painterly description generally very limiting when it comes to photographs and so on. But this plays nicely uh, on that point, I think. Yeah, I think that this, this photograph offers a kind of a meta commentary um, on the on the art of photography as, as an art of representation because it is in an advice comparison between the new medium or the newer medium and the older one, of course. And I think it also highlights um, the point of view and the framing of any representation that we have in both cases. So um, the fact that there is a painter um, recording the scene um, in the older medium also brings our attention to the borders of the camera, you know, the frame, um, that we're cutting a fragment of reality by means of a lens. And uh, we're looking through that lens and we identify with the invisible photographer behind the lens. Um, so so there, there's all these reminders that are, think, um, that, that are in this picture that Beyond, beyond what it shows, but there are all these sort of commentaries that are directed at the viewer. Um, I love this. It's a beautiful composition. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I, I noted uh, is the palette uh, in, in his, the artist's hand is um, really it kind of illustrates the monochromatic, you know, with mm -hmm some pops of color that we've been talking about really in a lot of the images in the beginning of our conversation today. We talked about the grays and the black and the winter and the dreary and 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 so to a certain extent, I think in a really small way, the, the artist validates <laughs> the photographic choices because you know, yes, indeed, here it is all very gray and dark and monochromatic. Um, so there's a kind of interesting play there. 
as well. I really wish we had Brendan here because I would love to hear him talk, you know, to find out if they talk to this guy. I, I believe it's a man. Um, yeah, it does say in the caption it is a man, you know, about what, what it was he was doing. Um, uh, and it also struck me that there's a kind of juxtaposition, you know, one could imagine people maybe at other times in the square, uh, artists going out and doing that, I'm going to go out to the square today and I'm going to paint and, you know, and maybe you just show up and do it when it's like this too, that's the unexpected. Right. There's always something to paint in the square. Also, I'm not sure if this is, I've never been to Kiev, so I can't answer this. Donald may be able to answer this. But it looks a little to me like the first photo that we saw in the edit today of the statue and the protesters near the statue. Is that statue in the in the middle far distance mm -hmm. of this image with amongst the smoke with the two flags on top? It may be, and it looks like yeah. that the first photo in this edit could have been taken in that scene, but close up, you know, at that moment. And if that's the case, then that's a great juxtaposition between these two things, using this one with the painting as a meta comment on the representation. Because, and even if it's, that's not actually the specific statue, just the fact that there's the cloud of smoke in there, one imagines a photographer right in close in the midst of that cloud of smoke producing something like the first image in this edit and yet here we are standing way back you know with the scene seeing the buildings around it actually seeing some sky to the left not quite so apocalyptic uh, as the rest and we do really get a a sense of the construction of the image here and the construction of the scene yeah i think that the caption um locates as near the Dynamo Stadium uh, in Kiev. Actually, it's the same location where the picture with the man kneeling in front of the priest is taken, uh, or right. thereabouts, yeah. On the same day, actually, January 25th. Right. So just to uh, kind of place us in time here, we have roughly 15 minutes, uh, a little bit less, uh, remaining and so um, we want to make sure we get to the other images in the edit as well. Um, so uh, if we could go back uh, a couple of images now um, to this one. Um, uh, one of the questions I had as, as I was chatting with Michael about the edit is I was interested in where women are uh, in the context of this conflict and I think we we, there are lots of examples both in this edit and elsewhere of the variety of places where women are. But this image, uh, uh, which is taken on February 24th, so uh, at, a, at, a, at a time when people are maybe transitioning from violence to mourning or commemoration in some way. And uh, this image to me, it does a lot of it does a lot of I guess you might say geographic work or public space work, uh, in the sense that it's attempting to place us um, uh, not only at a moment in time, but it's attempting to give us maybe a different view of the square uh, and what's going on there than than you would have had in the more conflict laden images. So let's talk a little bit about this photo uh, by Rob Stothard. He, uh, his photo uh, was also, we also had a second one of his in the edit, the one of the priest. My computer's going to die probably in about two minutes, so this might be my last uh, comment. Sorry, I was Okay, off. all right. Well, Donald, why don't we get you in here before uh, technology <laughs> steals you away from the us? The technology consumes me. It's my <laughs> bane. Um, yeah, i got to say, the... Uh, one thing about this whole story, not necessarily about the picture, but the whole story, the story began for me on February 18th when uh, the sort of seismic shift of when people realized what their government could do to them. And that was such a profound moment from one day uh, to the next to sort of live and experience uh, that utter uh, shattering of, I guess, um, uh, hope or a, a, a abandoning, abandoning all hope in the face of uh, something that was actually quite terrible. So really the story begins with this woman uh, with her flowers going to offer um, her condolences to the dead. And that to me is the most engaging part of that. In fact, I felt everything I did up until February 20th was sort of, I could just throw it away, get rid of it. The real story is February 21st. Hmm. 
So what is this? Is this an end? Is it a beginning? What is what is being pictured here, really? I think it's a beginning of a Ukraine uh, awakening to its reality, that the country to the east is ready to eat it and can't stand that it wants to uh, uh, break away and be free, and it's also realizing that the countries to the left of it, to the west of it, couldn't give a shit. Stuck in the middle between two giant voracious appetites. I think at the time, from the point of view of a, from from my point of view, or for some from someone here, it seemed to be such a shift. Um, it seemed like once they started shooting people, the the Maidan protesters won. I mean, it was it was obviously horrific and 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 tragic. But it seemed like that's when the momentum really sort of kicked in their favor because so many people were so outraged by the images that came out of it. And you had people streaming in and um, leaving flowers and memorials for all these people. Um, it, it, the, the tone really changed in, in general at that moment right after all this. Um, you know, it wasn't long after, I believe, where you started to see... Um, uh, Yanukovych's uh, private residence being ransacked and and so forth, and you you really saw things showing that the the Maidan protesters were getting the upper hand. So we thought at that time. Certainly, Donald's point about this capturing the old and new uh, is is. Just a real strength of this picture, the barricades and being evocative of all that, you know, primitive kind of symbolism uh, in so many photos, and then the woman w uh, wearing, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think she's exactly wearing Prada, but you know, to like bring us right into the present. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's really striking that way. Yeah, and the smoke. Kind of, oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Katya. The smoke has cleared, so we see the landmarks much more clearly in the in the photo. And I think there is a kind of a juxtaposition of the of the young woman with the flowers and the statue anchoring the square. So um, both of them, I think, work allegorically because we don't really know who this woman is, but she's a young woman and kind of like in um, advertising and travel photography, you have a young female figure anchoring the landscape. So <laughs> speaking of women as represented in the Maidan. Um, but I think, yeah, there's there's a kind of a, you know, if not peace, but the, the aftermath. This is a summary of the aftermath, people coming to mourn uh, the dead of the Maidan and uh, the order is not necessarily restored. We have all this um, improvised barricades um, still lingering there. And as far as I know, people are still camping out in the Maidan to this day. Um, so, so there's there's this kind of very uh, liminal uh, moment, I think, after the battle, the main battle is over. Yeah, there is just such a dominance of the dark, smoky, violent um, imagery that we were getting that almost looked medieval and all of a sudden we're brought back to a, a modern day European city with people dressed fashionably going out you know she's not wearing protective gear you don't see any any um, helmets or you know riot gear clad protesters or anything it was just um, when the, when when this image came out and it was um, when they when they were bringing the flowers and setting up the memorials for the people who had been killed by the snipers it was just uh, such a such a change of imagery um, that, that you know everyone realized the tone had really changed in the context of, um, of that idea of the changing of the tone um, why don't we talk about one additional image uh, in our edit uh, which, uh, Patrick, you referenced earlier, um, uh, the palace, <laughs> right? Um, so 
again, a change in tone, and there's almost a kind of visual relief. As you were talking just now, I was thinking that where our edit began two hours ago and where we're <laughs> ending now it, um, would seem to be a, 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 a progress from dark to light, but yet we know that is not the case, uh, literally, and it's all much more ambivalent. Um, so, but let's end our conversation by talking about this image. Again, like many of the other images in this wonderful edit that Michael put together, it really, this seems to encapsulate so many uh, of, of the themes that we've touched on in, in our session here. Uh, and this is an unattributed photo, which I think um, is also telling, and because it says a lot about where we are in terms of social media. And we didn't have a very long conversation today about how social media has been working in the context of Ukraine. But obviously, this is something that people are paying a lot of attention to uh, as well. So, so uh, thoughts on this image as, as we wrap up our conversation? Well, you just have this sort of, uh, you know, you might be reminded of some other things. I, I, for me, sort of like Ceausescu and his fall and other Cold War dictators, possibly, um, when they were basically run out of their lavish um, residences. Um, I was kind of surprised that there wasn't more anger and, and destruction at the residence. I, I saw some papers and, and things being sort of ransacked and, and so forth, but the overall atmosphere was one of people going to the park on a Sunday at afternoon or something and just strolling the grounds and looking at uh, at uh, the life of this person. I don't know how much exposure they might have had to this before, but um, just um, I think it's just relief and I think none of us at, at this point were quite prepared for what was going to be coming afterwards and the change of events, but at this moment um, you know it was it was celebration and and relief and and happiness I think. Does David still have audio? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I'm dying to hear what you think about this picture. Well, I think it's another another meta photograph. I think this is yeah. another photograph of someone with the iPhone, you know, taking photos. You know, this is how the vast majority of photographs in the world are produced. Uh, people on their mobiles uh, uploading for their own personal use. We don't often actually get to see them because they're uploaded to their own personal accounts and we don't have access to them. But they fill this great reservoir of imagery that's, you know, hundreds of millions of images a day now uh, being captured. We don't have this in the edit, but there's that very ser strange series of images now about people taking uh, mobile phone, cell phone shots of themselves with paramilitaries in the east, um, almost doing selfies with paramilitaries. In fact, I saw one today or yesterday, uh, a young married couple, uh, just married, uh, in bridal dress or whatever, and being photographed alongside, you know, uh, fully uniformed militiamen in the east and kind of wonder what's going on with those things but but to me this is this is the meta photograph of actually how most images are produced in these situations yeah this could almost almost be a, an ad for a, for iphone <laughs> it's sure. a part of a, yeah it's part of a sort of a global montage of how people take pictures in various scenic locations um, but it, there's also a sense of um, perhaps unwarded triumphalism and youth of course so there is a there's a sense in which um, young people in Ukraine are the ones who are represented iconically being in favor of, of Ukraine going west uh, rather than east and so since the the movement in the Maidan started with the student protests in the fall um, I think this this image beautifully anchors the sentiment the and she's either called wearing, Euro Maidan, right? Yeah, and she's either wearing or is dressed in the Ukraine flag. Yeah, it's a Ukrainian yeah, flag, yes. Dra draped off the, her back, you know, and yep. uh, it's also fascinating how people pose themselves in at the moment of photo taking. I mean, you see it in tourist locations. Someone whips out the cell phone, the mobile phone, and some someone immediately bodily adopts a posture 
they wouldn't normally adopt ready for the image to be made so that so that a good image can be made people are very aware of their own body in relationship to the image and so on so this is another great commentary on that presumably in front of the palace or or close to the palace well thank you everybody we are just about at the end of our time for this discussion I'm gonna uh, toss to Michael uh, to, to wrap things up for us thank you all Thank you. Well, I just want to thank, thank everybody for coming. It's a stellar panel, uh, and uh, we will um, be in the process of uh, doing video highlights and have an archive edition of the um, conversation up within minutes, actually, so uh, you'll be able to enjoy it again and um, circulate it. But uh, thanks so much. Enjo enjoyed it quite a bit. It's extraordinarily illuminating, um, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.